Hello guys, I'm back. My name is Jefferson Costa. I'm a chemical process engineer with expertise in plant design. And today I will interview the, the, the chemical engineering guy he is here with me, my friends, my friend Emmanuel Ortega uh, accepted my invitation to talk Aspen Plus and process simulation in general and we'll discover a little bit about his career. So Emmanuel, do a little, uh, talk a little bit about you and before I do the, the, the words to you, please guys, let, me, let us know where are you from and if we have here in process members from my Telegram channel, please say hi, I'm a process member because I, I'm feeling that today we will break some records. So, Oscar is with you. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm very happy to be here with you. Thanks to Jefferson for doing this for the process engineers and chemical engineers community. I think we need to create more content like this. Not only Jefferson and I, but everyone should be going online and posting content on chemical and process engineering. So, I don't know, Jefferson, what do you want me to do? Present myself, I think. Let me do some greetings here. We have people from Brazil, Ian. We have people from Nigeria, Isaac. We have people from Iraq, from India. People from India is always with me. It's very good to have you here. And Manuel, I, I will start to, with a question while we are winding up this meeting. And it, this is a question that I ask for every one of my guests is and it is, how was your transition from the graduation to get your first job as a chemical process engineer? Okay, so the very first job I had was actually an internship. I went to Germany for one year and the program was built that you studied one semester and you got an internship. Well, you search for an internship and do it by yourself. And I got my first petrochemical simulation work. So it was not actually an engineering design work, but I was always helping there, working with Aspen Plus. So that's when I, it all started to grow my knowledge. Back in school, of course, I had a little bit on simulation, but it was not until I was there with the Germans talking about the simulation and I was always pressured. So I did a lot of reading for myself. I didn't want to ask. I wanted to have all the background. So I think that that helped me a lot. When I got out of school or university, I searched for work in process engineering because I don't know about your countries, but in Mexico, chemical engineers tend to go either to the industrial part or the administration part in which they are involved in selling products or building plants and so on, or the engineering part in which you're actually in the chemical plant, doing the designs of the operation, control, shutting down, solving problems. So I was sure that I want to do that. I wanted to do engineering. That's what I want. I studied engineering. I wanted to be with the piece of equipment. I wanted to touch the equipment, work with it, uh, be with people that know a lot of that, especially operators that work there. They know how they, like intuitive, they know that if they increase the temperature, maybe something is going to change or so, but I think the engineer is the one that connects all this knowledge and makes the things work. Well, at least we should do that. And that's, I started to look a lot in, uh, I don't know how to say it, but in the university, they have this uh, website for recent graduates. And I got lucky, but I, I don't say lucky, it's uh, being prepared and being a little bit lucky. So I got this position, I just, took about three weeks to search for that. And it was a process engineering role in the textile industry. So it was between the area in which they actually produce polymer, which I really would have loved to be there. But once the polymer was sent to us, it was the spinning. How do you get the polymer and you convert it via spinning and winding into a thread of polymer? And I was there about one year. I really enjoyed the work there, but eventually I wanted to do my own stuff. So that's when I uh, finished my work there and opened my own business in chemical engineering for education and training. So that's my main answer, Jefferson. That's how I got 
from a student to a chemical engineer in a textile industry. You did something very interesting. Uh, first, you said you get a position with luck, but you you did a step back in the, and said that you, you was prepared for that. Uh, what kind of preparation you did in that time? I told you about the internship. I think having something of experience on a relatable field is important because there were many options being maybe a logistical engineer or maybe something that is not that related, maybe doing some marketing or, I don't know, maybe things that you say, okay, it's good enough for an internship, but if you can land a good internship on process engineering or at least in chemical stuff related, it's more or it's way easier to get a job because someone is already know, someone, the one that is going to recruit you already knows that you have been in the industry and that you are committed and they can ask you questions on that. While if you do not prepare or you don't do an internship related to that, it's very hard for them to trust whether or not you're going to have a good fit on the industry. So that's the very one. And of course, the only proof as a student that you have to say that you're committed to doing stuff or doing work and doing hard work is your scores, grades, projects in school. So if you have a very low score, it's harder for you to prove that you actually love what you do, or at least that you, if you have something to do, if you like it or not, that you will do it uh, with the maximum potential. So that's the two things. Try to land an internship and have good scores. Before I proceed to the other question, we have a people from Mexico here. And for those yeah, ones that I'm doesn't not. know, uh, Oscar is from Mexico. And he, uh, let me tell you some interesting things here. I first met Emmanuel in 2018 when I was doing, promoting an internet event in that time, but was not alive, it was recorded. And uh, I did some search in from people that would be sharing chemical process engineering subjects and I found Emmanuel in the YouTube and it was my first uh, source of inspiration to start sharing my experience in the internet. We talked a little bit and he was very, very nice guy with me and because with the contribution of the, the chemical engineering guy, you have it today in the internet, the chemical process engineer plan design. Without that, uh, probably I will not be here. Thanks a lot, Emmanuel. And mm -hmm. I will start with another question. That is how the chemical uh, engineering guy was born and tell us how, how was it? Okay, so as stated before, I was working in a chemical plant and I really wanted to do something of my own. And I really think it's very hard for a chemical engineer to go and make their own shop or own business because you need a lot of investment to build a chemical plant or a chemical product. And typically, if you're thinking in pharmaceuticals or Whatever product you're thinking, there's a lot of competition and there's a lot of investment in R&D. So it's very hard to actually find a fit in the chemical industry itself. So I started thinking and thinking, and I had, once again, luck that my brother started a YouTube channel and he started an online academy on how to play the accordion. And I also love Can Academy. I don't know if you know it. Maybe you do or you don't. But it's a, it was a guy, so as Jefferson told, he was inspired. I was inspired on this guy, which is uh, Mr. Kahn. He did online videos for education, math, physics, chemistry. And I thought myself, why I don't do the same for chemical engineers? And at the moment, there was almost no chemical engineering content. And I said, okay, it's a good fit, maybe. But I was also scared that I didn't know if people was interested. But as any business, I just started. I was young. I think it's easier when you're young and have less commitments. And I opened my own website. I went to YouTube, checked how to build a website, how to make a online university or, I don't know, courses. I started checking out about marketing, all the things that they don't teach you in chemical engineering or university, how to make your own product, how to test it 
how to have the most viable product. And so I started with my very first course, which was Mass Balance. In my opinion, it was one of the best courses out there because I had the problem with Mass Balance. It's either you love it or you hate it. And if you hate it, probably you are not going to enjoy <laughs> other courses. So I said, if I have this uh, course that helps people and they maybe they have problems in university, but they bought my course and they get it, maybe it will be easier for other subjects to understand for them and they will appreciate it. And if I do a maybe energy balance course, they will trust me because if I did good in mass balance, the next one will be energy balance. So that was my very general idea. Of course, I made some mistakes. Of course, I will have done much more interesting things. More importantly, I will have bought a better microphone. Back in, the, back in the day, I used the one on the laptop. So there are many things I would have done better. But the most important part is, as stated by Jefferson, you just got to do it, uh, get inspired, and do it. Take action. And for now, I think it's a very nice feeling to know that people are interested in chemical engineering and buying content in general. Of course, my content is out there and I'm happy that people find value in it. I always, I'm happy to get money back if they don't like it because I, it, if you don't like my content, it's, that's fine. So why would I charge you for something that you're not going to use and you don't like? So I think you always, in any business, the customer or the student has to be happy with their product. So that's how I'm doing right now. I'm still working on chemicalengineeringguy.com doing some process simulation courses. But right now I'm into mass transfer. I got a lot of petitions and I will be working on reactor engineering in the near future. So that's it, Jefferson. That's what I'm doing right now. Very nice, Emmanuel. Very nice. We Let me update here you from the chat. So we have uh, people from our Morocco and Mexico. There are a lot of people from Mexico in Nigeria also, and I have an in-process booster I'm in process here. And I, I have seen that you have a Spanish YouTube channel also, but you have uh, the, your biggest one is in English. You start with uh, YouTube videos in Spanish and decide to start in English, or it, how is the relationship between both of them? Well, I, the dream was in Spanish, of course. I wanted to test myself first with the speak, Spanish-speaking countries. I said, I, we need this a lot in Latin America, but it didn't work. I think it was a very small niche. And I think also, now thinking back, I check out my statistics, and not many people on Latin America will buy a course. They consume content, but they don't buy courses. And I'm glad that I changed to English because not only I'm helping more people because, for instance, Morocco people or people from India, I wouldn't maybe think about selling courses to them or contacting them. And right now, there's like a, a crazy amount of countries I wouldn't even think about teaching there. And I'm teaching and helping them. And that's great for me. So. The transition was because the business was not go doing that great. And when I started in English, I also felt more uh, happy with people. People were uh, congratulating me. And in Spanish, they were mostly asking me, why would I say that word in that slang? Or why do I say that? So for me, it was a little bit immature that, I don't know if it's the Spanish people, uh, Spanish speaking people. But in English, I think we are more open because you just want to receive the content and English is the main language nowadays. So that's the main transition I did, Jefferson. I, I talk to everyone that uh, listen to me that if you want to work with chem uh, chemical process engineering, plan design, you must know how to, how to communicate in English. It is very important. I did a short beginning in Portuguese also, but uh, after I, I went to China, I decided that all my content should be in English, and it is very rewarding to, to see how many people we are able to reach 
when we we are talking English. I have people from Azerbaijan, India. Now we have a friend from Thailand. I never seen anything from Thailand in the chat before. Thank you for being here. People from uh, Germany, Mexico, Canada. So it's very important to you that is studying chemical engineering to learn how to communicate in English. Don't forget about that. And we'll start the subject that most of you must be waiting for. So, Emmanuel, first, before you start uh, sharing a simulation with us, let me ask you, what is the difference or the main differences between the Aspen Plus and Aspen High Seas? That's one of the top questions I get daily via email, Facebook, and I don't know, maybe even LinkedIn. I think overall is what do you want to simulate if you want to do fine chemicals or oil and gas industry? And actually, in order to understand better, you need to get the history of these two companies. HiSys actually comes from Hydro Systems and Aspen Plus was, well, Aspen Tech software. So what Aspen Tech did was bought the HiSys or hydrocarbon system uh, suite because it was very powerful and it was very dedicated to oil and gas. So if you're doing some petrochemical things or if you're into gas transportation, if you're into LNG or LPG, maybe use HiSys. But if you are more into chemical itself, like bulk production of, I don't know, sulfuric acid, maybe you're in the chlor alkali industry, maybe even polymers, electrolytes, things that are more chemical than go for Aspen Plus. Now, the simulations overall are the same, whether it's HiSys Plus or Unisim, DWSIM, uh, Coco, in the thing that you first need to set up your physical uh, property environment or let it be the universe, I like to call it, you need to have a set of rules in which you're going to be treating the components, uh, their interactions, thermodynamic, transport, and all these things that are from the nature itself. Of course, we need something human, which are the equations or models that translate the actual phenomena into simulatable things. And the other part is actually working with the flow sheet, simulating the units, operations, connecting the streams, whether it's going to be in an energy stream, all those little details on whether you click right click or that unit will work with certain things. Those are the de little details, but if you get the idea on how simulation works overall, I think it's way more important to understand that rather than if you use HiSys or Plus. That's my take on the difference on Aspen Plus and HiSys. Make no worries, if you really understand HiSys, a transition to another simulation uh, software will be easy in the sense that you have everything like here, it's like as coding, if you learn C++ or C Sharp or whatever, Fortran, whatever thing you learn, the important part is that you have the logic. And of course, it's like understanding how uh, texting or typing, but if you have the logic, that's the powerful thing. Yeah, for sure. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. I start my career using Aspen in, in fact, in that time, it was not Aspen, it was only high seas with the, the green screen. And some years later, I used Unisim, that something like a, a relative of the Aspen high seas. But currently, I'm using the symmetry in, from Slumberger. And I have a, a colleague from my work right now, today. He, he, he is honor me with his presence, Daniel Away is my junior engineer and today I worked a lot and I did a, a PNID with a lot of red markup for him. So Daniel, thank you for being here. And my, what you should do or what you should know as a chemical process engineer is to understand the results that you get from the, your simulation because sometimes as Manuel said, if you don't know what you are doing, you get results that, in fact, is not uh, reliable. So that is, that's why it's very important 
to know what you, you are doing. And Emmanuel, just to not uh, be in the subject, I would like you to share a simple process simulation with us it, and it start uh, Aspen Plus simulation. And there are people, although for us that uses the, the tool, it seems that it's very, very easy to do that. But when you are using to Aspen High Seas and you go to Aspen Plus, it, it's not so friendly. You need to uh, get familiar with some tools. So please share, share something with us. Let me see if you are able to share. If you are not able to share the uh, screen, please let me I, know. I can share it now. Thank you. Let me start sharing. Do you see? It. Okay. So right now we're in YouTube. Can you see completely the presentation? Yes. Okay, so this is, just for simplifying this, this is going to be a case scenario on the bootcamp I have prepared. I actually feel more comfortable on Aspen Plus because I started doing that and I have been working more with that. But HiSys is not that complex. So let's go for the very first one. The main idea is to, here, to model a hydrocarbon system. It's going to be a gas mixture. It's going to be separated. We have hydrogen, we got methane. C stands for the hydrocarbon we're working. So C1 stands for a hydrocarbon that has only one carbon. That's only methane. Uh, C2 and C3 will be ethane and propane. C6, C8, all the way, it's going to be heavier materials. We got the composition of the stream right here. And this is for the sake of an example. It's not a real life scenario, but definitely helps. We have several conditions. The mix is to be flashed at the given pressure. Whenever you don't know about the pressure, assume it's total pressure, the temperature is 25 Celsius. The vapor line is to be treated as follows. The membrane separation is going to be separating the hydrogen and it's going to recover 98% of methane. The C2 to 3 line is to be treated in a separator and the liquid line is to be treated as follows. It's going to be cooled down to 15 Celsius, pressure decreased to one bar, and you can split the plant as follows, 70% and 30%. The main idea is to verify purities. What is the mole rate of plant one, volumetric flow rate of hydrogen? This is just, of course, not only for the actual simulation, but also so you can understand how to get volumetric flow rates. It's also a learning income. It's not only about doing the simulation for the sake of doing it. It's also for you to understand how Aspen Plus works. And we have several things. We're going to be covering it right now. So the main idea is to get this flow sheet. I actually recommend people or students to avoid watching this and try to, from this part right here, to try to imagine how it's going to be setting up in the simulation. These are the final results. This stands for the total mole flow rate. This little uh, rectangle is for pressure and the circle stands for the temperature. Celsius, bar, and mole, uh, kilomole per hour. So that's the, ma the main idea. Let's start working with the software. So I already opened a new simulation. What you need to do is first, as stated before, you need to set up the physical property environment, which is the universe. What is our little universe going to have? Well, we have hydrogen, methane, ethane, propane, hexane, heptane, and octane. Now, actually, this is a tricky part because you don't know whether it is iso-octane or n-octane or what type of hydrocarbon it is. So let's assume it's normal. Everything is going to be n Octane, okay, so we need to set up the component list, which goes right here. It's the first thing Aspen Plus is going to show you. So let's let's assume it's going to find it. Not always you're going to have Aspen getting your component, but because these are very common ones, you will in fact get them. So you can either type methane and hope it gets it. In this case, we did, or we can use C2. C2 stands for a thing. Sometimes you will get the result, sometimes no. In this case, we will. 
When the thing starts getting tricky, is C4 because you can have N butane or isobutane. So for now, if you just add this one, you will get the normal conditions, which in our case is what we want. Actually, we don't have C4, but it doesn't matter because if you add any component, if you don't add it to the streams, there will be no problem at all. Now, one little thing you will be learning uh, when you start doing simulation is that the more things you add, the more probable uh, you're going to encounter problems. So you don't want to mess that much. Try to simplify as in anything with engineering, you need to simplify things. Let's add C6, C6, seven, and C8. Always ensure that Aspen actually understood you. C4 and butane, C6 and exane. Sometimes if I were to add, I don't know, N5, you will not get something from Aspen and that will be an error, okay? Now we need to set up a thermodynamic package. For now, we don't have specifications. So let's assume the most common one for hydrocarbons. If you don't know, you can always go and check out with the method assistance, going to help you to select the most convenient for you. But for now, let's just assume the classic Peng Robinson equation of state, which is great for hydrocarbon mixtures. And then I will click next. As you can uh, see, let, let me stop you a little bit. Different from <clears throat> Aspen High C is that it is running all the time. In Aspen Plus, you need to click. There is two, okay. two buttons, different buttons here in Aspen Plus, next and run, right? So te tell us a little bit about them. You will use run in, in, in the future, but about the next, what is the part, importance of the next? So in my opinion, Aspen Plus is great because it's going to try to help you to fill the minimum requirements for your simulation. So when I click next, Besides, it's a habit of mine to click next because it goes directly to what you need to fill uh, next. But instead of me doing that, I could have gone directly to methods and select it. So from the component list, you have it right here. And if you know that you need to fill up something, you just go and click it by yourself. But when you click next, let's do it here. Aspen Plus is going to tell you or send you directly for what you need to do. So in this case, we... Aspen Plus is telling you the next step can be the following. You can run this, the property analysis if you have, so binary, solubility, pure, all these little analysis. You can modify the binary interactions or enter property parameters by your own or add experimental data. So maybe you work in your company and you have better uh, binary parameters on your own. So you want to use those, you can add them. Or the most common one will be since the physical property environment is already done and we don't want to comp uh, complex the simulation, we will go to the next part, which is filling the simulation. That's, the, in my opinion, one of the best things on Aspen Plus. And HiSys is what I hate because it runs automatically. So if you make an, an error, it will run directly. So tell us about that, Jefferson. What do you think about this next button? Yes, I'm, I'm, I have the opposite opinion of you, okay? But that's why I recommend you, if you want to learn or if you have a question related to Aspen Plus, you don't need to ask me because I will always address you to the chemical engineering guy, not me, not the chemical engineer in plant design. The chemical engineering guy knows a lot about Aspen Plus, not me. But, we are a great uh, composition. You do high seas, I do plus, and we are all happy. Okay, so continuing, let's go to the simulation environment. So right now we haven't done anything other than just telling the software what are going to be our components and what type of equations, models, all the things on how methane and ethane interact between each other, what will happen if they are pressurized, if they are liquefied, if they are at high temperatures, all that is set on the physical property environment. They have the rules. Now, the things that we're going to do is fill the flow sheet and start working with the unit operations and streams. So going back, we need to... Where is it? We need to start doing the simulation. As stated here, remember, if you click next, you have no idea what's next. Just click next. 
And here's the instruction. The first step on any type of simulation is to at least add one stream. If you have one stream and you set it fully, you can click run and you will get results. But if you don't have a stream, you will never be able to run the simulation. So let's do that. We will start with our initial stream. It's right here. Goes from left to right. That's very, I think, chemical engineering and process engineering common sense. You always go from left to right and recycle will go from right to left. Let's double click this and add this as fit. This is optional, but I really think it's important to make this as human as possible. And not only that, when you print it, you can show it to your boss or to your colleagues or maybe even to your uh, client. And let it's easier for them to understand that this is the start, it's the feed, it contains et cetera components. Now let's, for the sake of the process, let's click next. It still tells you that you need to work with the stream. So the only way to work is either going here or to the stream uh, folder right here. So I prefer clicking double click here. And we will start filling up our conditions. So the first thing we need to do is set up the, compo uh, the compositions. So sorry, I'm going to maybe uh, make you a little bit dizzy changing the compositions. And here is very important, of course, understanding that we added C4 in an accident. I see a lot of students that maybe do this and they will not, they will copy this into an Excel or maybe copy paste it here and they will have the last component with no composition. Always ensure to actually work with common sense and not just copy pasting things. And as you can see here, the total is being add, added up. Either you add by yourself a total of one. And what I need to do is also change molar flow rate. Make no worries, we are going to keep the numbers. And if you don't add a total of one, Aspen will try to force the results to a one because it's going to assume that maybe these can be normalized mathematically to at one. But we are going to, for the sake of this exercise, doing all these correct. Okay, so we have one. Once again, if you have an error, Aspen will try to either warn you or fix it. The stream is entering at 25 Celsius and three bar. So we just add that. If you are using English units, you can change it very quickly here. Or if you were to use atmospheres, well, you can change it here as well. Whenever you don't use A for uh, absolute or G for gauge, it's going to assume it's a total pressure. And the flow rate, for this case, let's use 100 kilomole per hour. Let's click next and see what else we need. So for now, we need to add a unit operation at least. And whenever adding a unit operation, typically you will need to have a, a output. So let's start with separator. We're going to try to model this flash. Now, the hardest part on understanding this uh, simulation is why I am going to use a separator, why I don't use a distillation, or why don't I use a separator here or a flash two? That's the point of learning simulation. So you understand what a flash works for and how it is used. You know how to model. It's always going to have a vapor and a liquid outlet. But you don't know here on the simulation. And that's the main idea to learn about it. I don't know you, Jefferson. I think this is the main issue, connecting chemical engineering with simulation uh, software knowledge. Yeah, uh, I like to use... Uh, in my content, I like to use uh, real cases because for me, it's it's uh, easier to, to teach people about process simulation because we can see uh, what makes sense. But uh, you are very familiar and in fact, you are a teacher. I'm not a teacher, okay? So it's nice when we, we understand what we are doing and what the result... we. Before doing the process simulation, in fact, you already have to 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 you already have to 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 know what kind of response or answer you will have. Do you agree, Manuel? That's true. That's totally true. You need to previous to understand what type of uh, results you want, and not only what are you going to get, but understand them and give them a sense to your actual process. 
So let's continue. Let's add, we're going to use flash two. Two stands for two outputs. So you're going to have a vapor and a liquid. Flash three can have three streams. Actually, we'll need to have three streams. But for now, we know that we need to have a vapor, well, a vapor stream, which is red. I, that's what I love about Aspen Plus and Hisis. Uh, well, actually, there's a little trick on Hisis. You can go directly to the unit operation and just at the stream. That's what I like about Hisis. Here, we need to go and use the material stream, click in the arrow and select it and name it. Let's call this vape. B1 stands for the flash. And let's add a liquid. Guys, only one advice. In the, in the end of this class or in the end of this live session, we will open some time to question and answer. So as Emmanuel is teaching, teaching you or showing you how to build a process simulation, we will not interrupt him right now, but in the end he will be with us to answer some questions, okay? So I ask for your patience, and if you have questions, let in the chat in order that I can read that and address some of them to the manual. Perfect. You let me know if you need something. So for now, maybe you thought that we can run the simulation, but as any unit operation, you need to define at least the common requirements. Now we're going to be doing this adiabatically, so we need to set up the duty. Duty is essentially heat or cool. We're going to be adding zero, and you can click or select that we're going to be working at three bar, or if you don't want, and this is once again, you need to understand the simulation. If we click zero, then what's going to be working is uh, with the pressure calculations of the system. But if you select three, you can have out maybe five or one. And what's going to happen is that the feed is going to go in. And once it goes into the unit operation, it's going to actually operate at the given pressure. So that's a very trick uh, understanding. When doing a lot of ana sensitivity analysis, I would recommend you to use zero because if you set up here to three, and many students don't realize that. If you change the flow rate pressure and you select, I want to change it to three, four, five, six, seven, it wouldn't make a lot of sense because the flash is operating at three bar. So you're going to have a lot of change here, but in the unit operation, it's going to be remaining at the same conditions. And that's when the engineer knows when you make a mistake, why I'm getting the same results if I'm changing pressure. I know that when I change pressure, I should uh, either liquefy or make more vapor. So that's important. I recommend you to either select in zero or three for the sake of this simulation. Let's use zero. And Click that's next. why I don't like the Aspen Plus so much because in high seas to do that, we just needed to add the stream uh, uh, valve to break the, to have a pressure drop if we have some. And the, the the stream minus the pressure drop will be the, the pressure of the, the equipment. We don't do the specification of conditions, process conditions in the equipment. Or if we do it, the equipment, it transfer to the stream. So in my point of view, it's much easier than Aspen Plus because of that. But go yeah. ahead, go ahead. I, I think that's straightforward. Actually, in real life, what you're going to have is the pressure of the stream, so it doesn't make that much sense. But I don't know, it's about simulating. That's the importance of understanding how your sim your software works. But anyway, let's assume that for this simplicity, uh, we don't, we're don't we not going to have that problem. And let's click Run. In this case, I click Next, and now Aspen will allow me to run it. All required input is complete. Let's click OK. And hopefully, I always say this, let's hope there are no errors, no warnings. Let's make our finger cross, and hopefully, it will get a run. Right now, it's computing, no errors. So this is the best outcome you can have. And not always the best, because maybe you have a problem, a logical problem that you are not getting, and you see the simulation run, and you say, yeah, I am the best engineer. I have my results. I'm going to say to show my results. And then when you go to the meeting, you see that, I don't know, maybe there was a logical error. That doesn't mean that the flash simulator is going to not work, but you know, maybe if you added another pressure or another stream composition, 
having a simulation that runs doesn't mean that that's the actual result that you have in your simulation, so uh, in your real life process. So that's very important to know that this is key and fundamental for the engineer to actually read, understand, and always compare the actual process with the simulation. Now let's go back. There are many ways in which we can go to the results. One of my favorites is just depending on, on my focus, it's going here, stream results or block results. Let's go to uh, results here. And these are the results from the block. And without even continuing, for now we have 73% going as vapor. So the remaining is going as liquid in mole fraction. Also, if you want to check, I don't know, the composition, which is more important, let's check out the composition of the vapor. Let's go to stream results, and we have the feed, the liquid, and the vapor. We were talking about the vapor, and let's go down. Either mole fractions or mass fractions. For now, we're using mole. And here we are, uh, so mole flow, mole fractions. We got the mole fractions. As, as suspected, you should have more hydrogen, more methane, zero of butane. That's very important. If you don't have zero, you definitely have a mistake. And a very small amount of the heavy hydrocarbons. So this is a very quick way to run the flash simulation. I don't know if you, Jefferson, shall we continue to finish it? Maybe I can uh, send you a link with the full simulation. Okay. Uh, do you have any general, talking only about the flash, you have any other uh, tips or, or consideration? Let's focus only the, in, the, in the flash and uh, and in, in the end of this, this, in the end of this live session, Emmanuel, we decide if we will share the simulation or not. Let's. It will depend on the audience if it participate, right. if we get likes and and whatever. Okay? Uh, I like the idea, Jefferson. That's great. Great to hear. So, any tips? Well, let's say that. This is actually not what we will expect in real life. What you will expect is to have a heat exchanger and a pressure exchanger or a ball, as you stated, before the stream. So you can, the idea of an engineer is to have the more, I, I know I said before to simplify it, but now that you understand the process, maybe you want to make this simulation a little bit more near to real life. Maybe you even have a mixer of gases. You can add a mixer. Or for now, let's do the heater before. And that's very important. Whenever doing more analysis, you will start understanding that it's better to set up the temperature before and the pressure before so you can actually change the unit operations rather than changing the pressure and temperature here. So let's do a heater. Just for the sake of changing this, now this will be the feed, or let's say pre feed heater. And our friend, click next. What's happening here? The main problem is that we don't have the condition. So, one tip I will say is always let's disconnect this one right here and send this one right here. And what we are doing is avoiding to set up two streams. And that's very important that if the streams are set up, Aspen will uh, see maybe an error that you have two streams that are uh, with the input. So what Aspen loves to do is to calculate from the initial value all the streams. So that may also encounter a problem later on, especially if you're working uh, with uh, simulations with recycle. That's a huge error because you have set up data and when Aspen converges or gets the data back, you will see a lot of errors. So what you want to do is avoid the least amount of inputs in your stream. So this now will be, whoops, this will be now your, let's say F2, and this will be our F1. So now we click next, still sending us to the F2 materials. Let's go back here. And let's add 
maybe we want to increase five Celsius our conditions. Once again, we can work with zero or three. Zero stands for no pressure drop. Any positive pressure will be the pressure that you want to set, and any negative value will be a pressure drop. So that's one powerful thing and important thing to consider. Jefferson, I don't know about HISIS. Do you have the, da the data? If you select a negative number, will it be a pressure drop? I never use it negative number. I think you no, cannot use to, a to negative To specify number. the equipment, not, but we can have the negative barometric, uh, sorry, uh, manometric pressure. We yeah. can set that. But in Aspen High Seas, there is a field specific for pressure drop in the equipment. So when it is important, like heat exchanger, we can add the pressure drop but it is positive, be always positive. I'm True. not, I'm not sure if it's all positive, but uh, that's a, yes, a, a, very, a very it, nice observation. You like that it's positive. We, I know that the pressure drop is positive, so I never try to use negative. That's nice. true, and that's one of the tricky parts on the both software. You need to understand that if you add here a negative, it's going to be a pressure drop. And if you select, I think in HISIS you cannot add negative numbers. So that's why you have a data for pressure drop. If you want to add directly add a pressure drop, it will be positive. So that's one of the things that you need to, if you use both of them, you will easily have the problem of, ah, oh, in Aspen Plus I can add negative, and in HISIS I typically don't. And here I have a part for pressure drop, and here I need to add a correlation. So it's a little bit tricky overall. The same idea. So let's, for the simplif uh, simplification, let's use zero. So whenever the pressure is changed, it's going to be changed as well. And here, let me, okay, we have all set up here. Manuel, I'm receiving some very specific questions here about oh. Aspen Blues. I hope yeah. you know the answer. Let's see how it goes. Okay, so what we're going to do now, as you can see before, and this is also some of the tricky questions on Aspen, before I had to set up the feed right here, and I told you that you need to avoid that. And what I did is remove and add a new stream, and now I don't need to add the input. Those are little tricks that you start learning, and it's very important because sometimes you need to fill up, and you fill it, and sometimes you just remove it, add it again, and you don't need to fill up, and it will work for your advantage. So in this case, actually, let's add a modification. I, I'm just curious. Let's click Run. The difference between Next and Run is that Next is not necessarily going to run the simulation, but if you have all the data, it's going to run. And if you have Run, it's going to force the Run. If you have errors or warnings or miss data, you will not be able to run it. And now let's add mole flow, pressure, vapor, and temperatures. Okay, so very quick analysis. We have 73% already in the feed, and that's our status quo. That's the stream because of the conditions. That's physical properties rather than simulation. That's our condition. And we have here, and let's act. Let me see if I can add heat duty here. Mm. You cannot add the, ah, here. So we got the heat duty because we are increasing five Celsius. It's going to be positive. And because the flash is operating adiabatically, it's going to be zero. So what we have is a very simple simulation. We are increasing from 25 Celsius to 30 Celsius. Pressure remains apparently the same. And this is also another little trick on lives. What you need to do is go to pressure. And what you want to do is to add more uh, percentage. Because if you check the result, this will be rounded up. The actual pressure is 2.75. Now, if you're in a very sensitive uh, simulation, you will definitely want to add more decimals. So for now, we have this heat duty. If you have a uh, heat exchanger that you know that you, also the units, uh, these are, let's go to results. Let's change to BTU. 
So you have a heat exchange rate that's about 80,000 BTU per hour, then you will be able to use it maybe. But if you have a way smaller, way bigger uh, heat exchanger, maybe you will need to adapt a new exchanger for that. And this is what I want to show you something. Let's make a little bit more drastic. So we have a lot of vapor. Let's see what happens if we cool down our stream. We cool down, we should get more liquid. And you can see that, wait for it, 12 Celsius, 3, 71. And because, okay, we're getting, okay, we didn't decrease that much from 73 to 71. So what we, need, we need this way smaller temperature, maybe five Celsius, which will be very low for a flash right now. And what you see is that we are not getting errors and warnings because this is within the physical possibilities of the system. And what you see is every time you cool down, you're getting less vapor. Previously it was 73, then 71, now 70. And that's what you want to do with a simulation. Jefferson, do we have more time or shall we go to questions? Some we tips? We have some comments? time, but I'll, uh, I, will go, I will open to questions in a few minutes, but before doing that, let me ask you, you have a lot of, of students that learned Aspen High Seas, uh, sorry, Aspen Plus with you during these years. And my question is, what is the most, uh, what is mo most harder to them? What, what is very difficult to them understand or to learn? Uh, what is the main questions that you, you receive that they are not getting the results that they should get? Well, the number one, I would say that a lot of them are students that are in, don't have the process itself. So it's very hard to just imagine and work in a simulation, especially if you don't have that much experience on the processes or quantities, amounts don't make sense to you. So I'm pretty sure for you, Jefferson, you make a simulation and you relate something to a real life scenario, maybe not the same plant, but another chemical plant or other processes that you have been working with. And you maybe say, it's logical that I have this stream that big, or is it logical that I only have vapor? Is it logical that the pressures are decreasing that much? So that helps definitely a lot. And what I see the problem is with most of my students is that they don't have a grasp or a feeling on how processes or chemical processes work in general. So that's the hardest part. And that's the thing that comes with experience. The more you work in a chemical plant or the more you work with simulations and you compare and share results, the more you're going to be feeling confident to uh, make an assessment on your process. I don't know what you think, Jefferson. Uh, in my point of view, Emmanuel, the chemical process engineer is the engineer that gets the problems and transform that in drawings. So it is very important to you when you go to a kickoff meeting or when you visit your client or customer and you hear about the problem that you must solve, you transfer that in drawings. So using at first the block flow diagram and after that a simplified process flow diagram it will help you a lot before starting doing simulation because you see the, the process as a, a, you have an overview of the process and with that start building your, your solution or your solving. So I agree with you, it's not so easy to understand and, but it's possible to learn because we are proof of that, right? That's true. You... The more you learn and the more it happens, the more you see, you will see, I don't know, fellow engineers, a senior engineer that see a process and they will tell you, nah, it's, you just need a heat exchanger with the given conditions. Uh, they, they will tell you the sizing, almost a perfect design in two minutes. And you're like, wow, I need to go to the simulation, feed the data, run it, see the better, best case scenarios, fouling, call to the seller of the heat exchanger if that's possible. And that's only with experience. The more you work on that, the more you will uh, not only feel confident on your uh, assessment as an engineer, but you will start having this, uh, uh, this position of that's the guy that knows. So the more you work towards that, the better. 
And today I received a question, a question asking about helping a guy in LinkedIn to build a process simulation for a urea, urea plant. And I will do an audio to share with people in Telegram, my Telegram channel, but I will share with you that are live with me. And he, he is already a chemical engineer and he works in a urea plant. So what, he, what you should do to start building your process simulation? You have at least, if you have any document, you have at least the pipe instrumentation diagram. So from there, you can get the process of your plant. And most often you will have a process flow diagram and it cannot be updated, but at least you, you have the operations, then unit operations and etc. And if you are in working a plant, you have something that many of people don't, don't have that is real data. And that is very, very uh, helpful when you are doing your process simulation because you know that you will add a stream before each exchanger and you already know the results that must be, be that you must have in the outlet and it's only a matter of uh, knowing how the software works to get the, the, the correct results. So uh, I would like to, to share this because don't be lazy. If you have all the information, get that and start building your process simulation, okay? And Emmanuel, I will start with the questions. And Let's see how it goes. There, there is some question that is very specific and our time is short. So I, I'm not expected that you, you have the answer right now for them. Okay. But I will read the, the world question and do some comments. And if I, I believe that I need. And the first one is from Baba. And what is the preferred property method to simulate an uh, integrated process consisting of water electrolysis, CO2 removal from gas stream, and methanization. The desired end product is methane. I, it, it is very specific, and I would like to, that you talk to us about how to choose the best uh, fluid package for a, a, a process. What you should do if you, don't, if you are not so sure how the fluid package best fits for a process simulation. Okay, so the first thing you need to understand is that you can use several packages within a flow sheet, because remember that processes are itself working in a little universe. So if you're using, I think you use CO2, hydrogen, and water, and electrolytes, what else? Uh, water, ele water electrolysis, CO2 removal, and methanization to have methane as its product. Okay, so technically you have several processes. You have the electrolysis, which can be carried out in a single... I know what you think about the integration is that you want to have everything in one simulation. So what you can do is uh, child and mother designs. So in your child design, you can have the electrolysis, which works uh, with the NRTL uh, models. And then you can go to the mother. So that's that will be for the unit operation. And then you go to the mother design and then you will have, then you have CO2. Those are gases typically modeled with Peng Robinson. That's good enough. Of course, if you have very specific uh, conditions, you can change that. And if you don't have a doubt on what type of uh, package you need, always go to the method assistant. I think those are very good enough. Of course, uh, depends a lot on the applications, components, quantities, pressures. It's very hard to just assess right now. But in general, you can do that. A stand for the process, separate them. If you know that polar systems require a activity model, you know that non-polar components will require a uh, equation of state model, and electrolysis will require a electrolyte system, most likely. That will be my answer, Jefferson. Nice, very nice. And you can use it also the, the help of the software, right? There is the, the fluid package uh, assistance, and it is very helpful to understand what is the limitation of each kind of uh, equation of state and etc. Another question here is from Fergus, and 
Regarding real process versus simulation output results, how would you be able to tell how realistic your simulation results are? For example, if you're doing simulation for design purpose. What do you think about this? Well, that's what I was telling about Jefferson. He has is a very good example that the more you work, the more crazy things will seem for you. So for now, I like to talk about to students in chemical engineering when you say a ton of uh, some material, 10 tons, 100 tons, 100 grams. So try to imagine how much that is. Uh, if you need to move, if I tell you tomorrow, I need to move one ton of uh, soil, what do you need? At least you need uh, a truck. If I tell you I need to move 10 grams of such material, you wouldn't even think about whether you need a car or not. So that's the feeling, or also with sizes. Uh, I have a lot of students that tell me, ah, so this is 1,200 meters of piping for the heat exchanger. And you're like, how are you? How do you plan to have 1.2 kilometers of pipe? So those are the things that are common sense. And the more engineering you go, you will start understanding more common sense. For me, it's very hard to tell you that uh, with simulation, you can do that. It's very hard because the problem with simulation is that makes the typical engineer just go like this and you just get numbers and there are no errors, no warnings, and you just keep doing simulations and maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense in real life. So it's hard to answer that, Jefferson, but experience or at least asking, try model something, make analysis and post it on, uh, on the internet asking whether is it realistic or not. That will be a very quick guess on what I will do. If I don't know about a process, I will go online and ask. And of course, don't trust people online just for an idea. Always the engineer, it's you. You are the one in charge. So that's why, I don't know, Jefferson, it's hard for me to, under, uh, to reply to that question. Yeah, in my point of view, if you are learning, if you are a student, but if you are an engineer working plan design and you are learning the Aspen Plus or Aspen High Seas, you should start with the with examples. So it is very important to have examples to you simulate first what you already know the results for after that you apply that for another process. And but but you you must be care about that because there are books that, although they are the it is books, they doesn't have a, a very good uh, uh, results to 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 help you to learn process simulation. And one uh, example, very clear example, I recorded a, a class related to sulfur recovery, and I tried to understand, or I tried to simulate a sulfur recovery unit using Aspen High Seas. And I tried to follow the book uh, steps, and I was not able to do that. So what I did, I res I did a lot of research to understand the process. So I get books, I back, I get uh, papers, and I also I have seen some YouTube videos. And and when you understand how is your process. It's easier to you to, to understand what kind of results you get, and with that, you believe or not in the results. So my first question is, is start, uh, sorry, my first tip is, is start with examples that you already know the results, and with that, you can is, uh, understand the process and apply for, for other kinds of for increasing, decreasing the the parameters of your process simulation. Okay, so let's see another. Uh, I have a very specific question here. It is from Ian, or Ian, sorry if I didn't spell you correctly, but he is telling that uh, he, have, he has a problem in the production of biodiesel from oil, uh, soy oil view homogeneous catalysis. And what is happening is that for some reason the aspen is unable to convert the reaction giving a problem called uh, the M ball loop did not convert. What you know what is about? 
And what is the 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 care or what is the tips for setting equations in in Aspen Plus, Emmanuel? Because if you don't have the right uh, equation and if you did don't have the right parameters to add that, for sure you will not be able to convert your pro simulation. Well, that's very specific. I will need to check out because you're when you're using Catalyst, it means that you need to have already the model that works for the uh, reaction or the kinetics. And my main experience with reactors is whenever you see something not convert converging, is because there's an issue with the kinetic uh, model or the data, the input, maybe the kinetic model is correct, but the input is maybe not correct. You're using uh, different units or maybe uh, magnetos are not correct. Also, what I see, I, I've seen also, they have applications maybe that the reactant must have less concentration than one to three percent. And the engineer forgets about it and starts modeling 10%, 20%. And it starts going crazy because the model is not prepared for that. And Aspen, what does is just math equations. So what happens, maybe some convergence will go to infinity. Some will never be found. Others will give you incorrect data. So for that specific question, I cannot answer you. Maybe if you want to send me an email, I can check and see what happens. And the problem with reactors is that when you use Catalyst and those type of Kinetics is very hard to get a result if you don't have a lot of data. I, I when I was recording my, my, my a class for my training program and I was talking about reactions and I was doing a very simple exercise that I got from a book and I was not able to convert in any way the, I forgot what the, it was, the, the reaction. But after many and many hours, I realized that I was not able to convert the result because I was using mixed units of mixed Activity. units. And when I shift for SI or, in a, in a, or when I shift with, for English, I get the conversion. I was really mad about that for sure, but I learned. Sure. I learned for for the worst for the worst scenario. Very hard. Not even in in SI units. Sometimes you have for the activation energy, you got kilojoules per mole, and then you set up another parameter, and it is only in joules, and you just click joules, 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 and you have a magnitude error. So it's very hard to model uh, to have problems with that. Is the worst. So, yeah, uh, one tip that you could try is to let your units, if you are not doing that, in the same, in the same uh, standard. So use only one kind of, of units in order to see if you get the results or you will need to, be to, to research more to verify what's happening. And let's see another question here. Uh, there are, there are uh, I don't know how to spell this name, but there are people asking for some examples of pro simulation and the, the, the Baba will, as uh, uh, Emmanuel said, you can add many fluid packages to your pro simulation and you just need or you can uh, research that in the, in the, Fluid package assistance one by one and verify if you get the result that you want, okay? So, I don't have too much questions, Emmanuel. Uh, I have a general question here from Ivan Jimenez and he's your compatriot from, from Mexico. How do you see the future of the oil industry? That's a very open, open question. We see strong because definitely it's the only thing we have been basing our economy, industry. Maybe I see a lot of government policies forcing, making more profitable uh, energies, uh, sorry, less profitable energies, more profitable via taxing. 
but I'm pretty sure we are going to finish oil eventually. And I'm pretty sure that we are going to be dependent on oil until that happens. Uh, price is going to increase naturally. And what you're going to see, or I think that's my very raw guess, I'm no expert on the field, but I will assume that the governments are going to uh, subsidize less oil and gas and start subsidizing more other alternative fuels until it starts maybe balancing about the amount of energy. I don't know if we are going to be able to sustain that, but let's see what happens on the future. Fortunate, the market eventually levels up. Either energy is going to cost them way more, so transportation increases, everything is going to start balancing. It's very hard to see, but if you are asking this because you want to go to the oil and gas industry, definitely I see at least 30 years worth going there and maybe going as a oil operator, drilling, all that. It's still worth it, still earning much more than the average engineer, so why not? If you are maybe thinking on specializing a master degree, uh, I don't know, that will be a more of a tricky question, but I don't know, what do you think, Jefferson? I think you are in Brazil, you also have a very strong oil industry. That's a... Uh... It's, it is a kind of subject that I, I, don't, I don't reflect about because if you want to work with plan design and, and that is my expertise, what I, I tell to my students and, and to my members is that pump is pump. It doesn't matter if it is in the oil industry, it is a fertilizer or if it's a CO2 removal, it doesn't matter. So you must know about uh, fluid dynamics and including piping design. You must know about uh, rotating equipment, pumps and compressors, and you must know about uh, heat exchangers. If you know these three uh, with a solid basis, you will be able to do a lot of plan design in, in many industry, different industries. So I'm not so worried about the oil in specific because if you are good enough uh, technically good enough and if you have connections and uh, build strong connections with people you will uh, get job easier than other people that don't do this kind of thing and uh, I would like to to get this the subject and we are facing the COVID is something that uh, for me it's the first time that I see something so big that it stopped the world in, in some way. And what do you see, uh, what will be different for the chemical engineers in the, from today to the future? What do you think about that and how it can affect the, the work? I don't know, it's, hopefully this is going to end near, but I think it has helped to uh, increase the rate of digitalization for many industries, even engineering or chemical engineering. I think a lot of uh, maybe apps or things that the, the engineer, the process engineer can work from home. Because I remember when I used to work as a process engineer that I have to go to the plant in order to tell the people and check the software. I am pretty sure that nowadays the idea is, okay, I have my cell phone and I got me my desktop, check the data. So make some calls or maybe just a uh, Zoom conference and make it happen. That's definitely something worth uh, sharing. I don't know, mid-future depends on how long this takes. Uh, a lot of uh, sanitization technologies, detergents, gel, all that definitely a boom. It used to be now stronger. So Previously, I said that it was hard to make business on chemical engineering, but right now with such products that are not that capital intensive can be an option maybe. I don't know, Jefferson. It's a strange question to answer right now. Yes, we never know the future, right? We are only sharing what we believe. So it's not wrong or right. It's just... Uh, the way that we see the future events. And Emmanuel, it, it was very nice to have you here with me. We passed almost 15 minutes from your, the previous agreed time, 
time. And I will like to you give you a final message to the people that are here. And it was, it, uh, we break some records today. Okay, I will sh when we finish here, I will share with you the results. And thanks a lot, people, for being with us here. It is not so common see uh, two chemical engineers so activated in the internet working together. Sometimes people want to have a rivalry, and it's not the case that I have with Emmanuel. We are very, very good friends, and I will always... Uh, recommend him if you want to learn Aspen Plus for sure. And Emmanuel, is up to you. Well, first, thank you, Jefferson, for preparing this, not only for myself and the interview, but for everyone that needs more content of engineering. For me, it's great that, I don't know, to see people that also enjoy uh, having this type of talks, helping each other, and especially I think that we need to unite as process and chemical engineers to help others. And I think we are small amount of engineers, but we are in charge of very crucial and important industries. So definitely we need to get together. And thank you once again, Jefferson, for giving me the opportunity to be once again with you. I remember, still remember the time I sent you that video. For me, it was very strange, but right now it's normal what we do content online before it was strange right now I, I really enjoy it and if you want to check out courses I will send you all the information later maybe Jefferson helps me uh, with the contact and all that info make no worries I'm the chemical engineering guy you can find me easily I think hopefully and if not make no worries Jefferson is going to uh, if you have questions regarding the simulation I have a complete video on the case study of course, this is just for learning, not that much based on actual processes. I do have some that are based on processes, but essentially these are for students to learn Aspen Plus. To Jefferson, that will be everything. Once again, thank you so much. Guys, you can find the Emmanuel courses in, in his website, uh, the chemical pro, the chemicalengineeringguide.com. I type it in the chat. And you have also the Udemy. If you type there uh, Aspen Plus, you will see uh, only Emmanuel courses there. And they are very, very good rated. And so if you want to learn more about Aspen Plus, I, re I really recommend you to take a look on that. And just to before uh, finishing the transmission, Emmanuel, do you think that I should share the Aspen Plus example that you show us here in my telegram channel in process do you do you believe that they deserve that i don't know jefferson you know more your people i will i will okay. say yes what do you think i think that we i have people here that reserve deserve and if you can share with us the the file i will let available there and also with your your website and more information sure. that you have. In fact, if you have a, a folder, I will share in my Telegram channel, okay? Great. Let me prepare that content. Maximum tomorrow I will send you everything. Video, file, simulation, data, uh, yeah, everything. Okay. Thanks a lot, Emmanuel. I will finish the, pre the live session. And I hope that in the near future, we go, come together again. See you soon, my friend. We will, my friend Jefferson. I, I'm willing you to invite you to my podcast later on. Okay. See you guys. Thank you, Jefferson. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ok, 